Now, when you talk about judgment, judgment is what sees to the conclusion or termination of the proceeding. So every time we are talking about judgment, that, that day is the end of the entire proceeding. That's the day the entire proceeding will do what come to end. Whether he is guilty or not guilty will be pronounced on that very day. So judgment is the final order which a court makes after taking evidence from both the prosecution and the defense. So that's the final order that the court will make after taking evidence from the prosecution or the, the, and the defense, sorry. And this happens when a matter proceeded to full trial. This happens when a matter proceeds to full trial. So in other words, there could be judgment that may not be delivered without the necessity of having a full trial. Now, one thing you will note when you talk about judgment, the first thing you need to know is that judgment in criminal proceedings, the dressing of the judge is important. The dressing of the judge is important. So if the judge is to give judgment in a capital offense, that offense involving life imprisonment or even death penalty, the judge is usually garbed in a red look. But in other cases, other circumstances, the judge robes as ordinarily, just the way he robes to come to court. So that is important. We know that. And um, in judgment, we must appreciate the fact that the job of a, a judge is not an easy one. You know, you listen to side A and also side B. You sit down to evaluate and analyze the evidence before you and begin to write your judgment. In addition to other cases, other matters, the judge is enjoined by law to handle. So when I'm talking about the law, seeing that it's not an easy task, gives a period of three months for a judge to write and deliver his judgment. The period of three months. So that period of three months is taken, takes into cognition the busy schedules of the judge. But then too, you discover that in practice, the three months is not even enough. So, but if you are reading it from a textbook, you have not experienced it practically, you would not understand. And you'll be asking, ah, what was the judge doing that he waited till after three months before he's delivering judgment? Does it mean that the judge does not know that the statutory time limit for delivery of judgment is three months? Some judges could stay a year plus because of maybe how busy they are, but it's not an excuse. The other, since the law has said three months, so judges have to do what to comply with that law. They have to handle it. You know. So if, for instance, a judge fails to meet up writing his judgment within three months and delivering them within that same period of time, that does not modify the judgment of the judge. Except it could be shown that Failure to deliver the judgment within three months resulted in to miscarriage of justice. So if there is no miscarriage of justice, there is no way that judgment can be set aside for having been delivered late. But then we should also know that there are some lateness that, that can be very inordinate. I mean, you know, you look at the time frame and say, ah, look, this one is not reasonable. So the appellate court facing that uh, circumstance, we simply look at the judgment of the court, look at the evidence of the, the proceedings to know whether the judge derailed somewhere in the line of reasoning due to lapse of time. You understand? If, for instance, now, uh, uh, like you're writing your project, if you set out to write now, and the zeal is there, you write today, tomorrow you write, you see no what you do. But drop it for one week and see what happens to you. 
Bianca, and to connect, to reconnect becomes a problem. So that is the way it is for the judges too. That is the way it is. So for you to accept that judgment, you must be able to find out that the delay has somehow occasioned miscarriage of justice. I'll give you an instance. There was this matter I was doing with a senior lawyer. You know, when they filed the matter, I looked at it, I filed a preliminary objection. You know, and um, we took the application, the bill, the judge adjourned for ruling. Three months, nothing happened, six months, nothing happened. I said, my Lord, uh, can we readopt? Because at times that's a day saving measure. So you readopt, your time starts to count again from that day that you have readopted. I said, my Lord, can we readopt so that uh, this thing We readopted, and something happened. It took almost two years for my Lord to give judgment. Lo and behold, the Lord gave a judgment in my favor that, and you know what the senior on the other side said? After the judgment was delivered, it was supposed to be a ruling. And when the Lord read it, she read judgment. And uh, the man on the other side asked me, which are you going to appeal against the judgment? <laughs> it was in my favor. But due to the nature of it, it, it was something that, assuming it's anything serious, are we even appealing against it? It was supposed to be for ruling. I wanted the matter struck out, but you're giving me judgment, dismissing the matter. That wasn't what I asked for, you know. But one good thing was that within the period when the judgment was being delayed, the party settled. And that saved us too much grammar. You know, that saved the day. So time is of a sense. So a judge. Having a matter when it gets to that stage must be able to make out time. I think it's better you delay other matters that have not got into that stage than the one that has reached the judgment stage. I also have a similar one in Kubwa. You know, I couldn't go last Friday, but uh, the judgment was delivered also in my favor. That's after a year, six months. And we adopted up to three times in that very one. Well, I, I told the council representative to apply for CTC so that we'll look at it <laughs> and know whether it is even injurious to us. You know, it was such a clear case, you know, but then the fact that it's a clear case does not mean a judge cannot make a mistake. He's a human being just like us. Do you understand? Yes. So that's why when the matter is fresh in the memory of the judge, the judge is enjoined to take advantage of that opportunity and start writing judgment. So, and in judgment, no particular style is prescribed because you cannot prescribe, just like everyone is here now, I can't prescribe the way you write. The way you write, even if two or three are sitting together, you can't be writing the same way, am I right? Everybody has his own pattern of writing. Like somebody like me, I like him poetic. You know, because I started writing poems almost from almost from primary school. <laughs> so if you see my work, I I do it prose, but I do more of poetry. You know, there are judges like people like CC Ways eh, of blessed memory, people like uh, Pasa Cholono, um Pukucha JAC, Kayode Shop. These are judgments and with the people that you need to, you want to read their judgment. Just to enjoy it. The flow of language. You know, there are people who are so gifted. You know. So but in the midst of it all, the requirement of the law is that whichever side that you have chosen, make sure that you do what evaluate the facts before you. Evaluate the case of Mr. A and the case of Mr. B. Right and put your reason together and match it with law. So that, and make sure you are not adding what is not there. And you are not also doing what, subtracting what is there, subtracting from what is there. So those are the ingredients of judgment. As for style and other one, nobody can tell you. It's a free style, you can adopt your own major in writing your own judgment. All right, so we look at types, types of judgment. Judgment will be delivered on the first day of the matter. 
depending on what happens. If the charge is read to the defendant and he pleads and he after pleading guilty is put to trial by the magistrate to ensure whether he understands the plea taken. And when the judge seems or the magistrate is convinced that this person meant to plead guilty to the charge. The next thing that will follow is what? Conviction. The court will convict the person and then we will now move over to the next step, which is what? Sentencing. Right. Now also, you can have a situation where a party will just decide to do a plea again without going into full trial. Remember I told you, when there is a plea bargain, you are no longer a saint. You, also, you already have a dent in your character. Because plea bargain is also what? Conviction. You know, like what I've said, part of the incidence of a plea bargain is disgorge all the ill-gotten wealth from the person, or take the person's plea and reduce the punishment. So either way, the person is going to be an ex-convict. It's going to be a convict. But the only thing is that you're going to reduce the level of what you ought to suffer in the end. And then again, that will also depend on how helpful he has been to the prosecution and to the state. If, for instance, he has shown every support that's when the state will now come and say, okay, instead of um, putting you down there for seven years, you just do one year. It could just be a very light sentence. But so long as it's sentence, it is what conviction. So then we can also, we also have um, a situation where the judgment is positive. Where the judgment is positive. For instance, if a preliminary objection to the trial succeeds. The order striking out the charge is what is judgment for that very purpose because it can be appealed against. But in, in some cases, because no trial has been held at all. But if the nature of the objection and the order given is so that this person shouldn't have been tried at all, it becomes what a positive judgment in favor of the defender. Another you know, a way a positive judgment can be given in favor of the defender is when he is no case submission succeeds. If he is no case submission succeeds. In that case, he is uh, discharged but not what? Admitted. And you know, most of the time, they will just, uh, a lawyer will simply tell you, let those get in that stage. Get this time first. Let's forget about it. Because the state may not come back. The person may not be rearrested. Especially if it's, uh, and if it's not an offense that breaks the conscience or that calls for the use of the society, that will mandate the prosecution into finding a way to bring the person back. So you discover that at times somebody can get a discharge and then that is all. Even though under the law, it does not mean what a pizza. But when you are discharged and nothing happens, as far as you're concerned, it's one it's a pizza. Because you are joining your complete freedom. Alright, so we cannot then also talk about the judgment that is given at the end of a full trial, that the judgment on the marriage. The judgment on the marriage. So in this why the prosecution has testified. Defense opened and closed, and then in the end, judgment is given either negatively or positively, depending on which side one person is. Because if the defendant is convicted, it's a negative judgment for him, but a positive one for the state. If he is a child and acquitted, it's a positive one for him, and a negative one for the state. All right, so so far, so good. One to, the next thing we want to look at here is sentencing. In a situation that the defendant has been found guilty at charge or on some counts of the charge, and the next stage will be sentencing the defendant. 
courts always create room for mitigation of punishment. And the room to be created for the mitigation of punishment is the opportunity in line with the constitutional right to fair hearing. Because at this stage, the one that presumes you innocent is what is already taken away. It's no longer there. It has been shown that you are not innocent. But the constitutional right to fair hearing will also want to create room for you to be heard to find out, ah, why did you do that? Right. And then the person pleads to what is called allocutus. Allocutus is just a plea for leniency. Now, if you have some of the common, in some of the common law countries, where the judges have uh, possibly wider discretion, you will discover that, depending on the nature of the offense, some allocutus can also, you know, result in that kind of saying, go and see no more. Right. But the law doesn't mean it that way. The law doesn't mean it that way. But when you look at the philosophy behind punishment, you also see that it is what it is ingrained. It is there. This philosophical, the moral philosophical basis is also what is there. Right. Now, let's say, for instance, somebody has stolen out of hunger. And, um, and the person said, I don't want you to go into trial. I'm guilty. You know. And then um, court convinced the person and say and asks you to plead and the future and say, I did it because I was hungry. You know. And then you would be <laughs> I don't think you would be better than the devil to say, go ahead and punish him. I mean. You are the owner of the bread. Can't you spare that one? It's okay, let him go with the bread. All right? Okay. So we have what situation, circumstances, even under Judge Judy, family calls, and some other clips, where things like that will happen. The judge won't just simply say, go home. And the judge will first of all take the nominal complainant to task. You have heard this person say he was hungry. Well, how do you plead? What do you now say? And you see some recalcitrant person. Yes, let the Lord take it or let him go to prison. All he knows is that this is the law. It is my right. He stole what does not belong to him. You are right to say that. But that's where the moral teacher comes in. And it is that moral teacher that has brought about the world. The of Anukutu. And the, in a situation like that, the judge will now say, I want everybody in the court to pay $33. <laughs> <laughs> and they will contribute three dollars and this guy goes home richer. <laughs> it's not an encouragement for that person to go out there and see. It's because of the special circumstance of his own case. Now, by the time we look at the philosophy of sentencing, we also look at some other you know, kind of form of sentencing that may even uh, be amusing, but they are called to some specific principles of the law. Now, when you look at, let me discuss the principles of uh, the philosophy behind uh, sentencing now, before we look at types of sentencing. So the principle is mainly restorative justice. That's the general principle for punish, punishing somebody or sentencing someone. Is that of restorative justice. Now, restorative justice is like a box that can have some things inside. It's a container. So when you open this box, you're going to be seeing things like reconciliation. Reconciliation. So reconciliation as an aspect of restorative justice, aims at not necessarily stigmatizing the convict, not necessarily stigmatizing the convict, but finding a way to reconcile him to the society. Because when it, something like that happens, the person becomes a, a, a barrier. You understand? If he's not taking seriously, like, here, go to the West. Ah, alien war. Do you know what it means for somebody to be alien war? Your whole generation, your children, your grandchildren, the so-and-so-so that the grandfather was an alien war, you don't, you don't even have a mouth. 
Don't have mouth to say anything in the society. You know, so that's the kind of thing the law wants to remove. We have punished him for what is wrong. The next thing is to do is to reach If the law can be, let me even say stupid enough, to recognize the rights of the LGBTs or whatever, what about this person who committed a crime due to the pressure of the society? Who among two of them, who do you even have sympathy for? Is the person that has committed crime, am I right? Is the person that has committed crime. The other person is a phonic of his own. God created you a man and he wants to be a woman. That's a business. That's a business. So why would it affect my human right? You know, why would it affect my country? That is say that this country, if you don't recognize this right, which right? Which right? You understand? So that principle of reconciliation is one of the integral elements of the restoration justice. And then the second one is restitution. Restitution. If there's a, a religious group that believes so much in restitution, it was deeper life. Am I right? I remember way back when I was in university, I was looking for a church to attend. Then it was always Magada. And because of the crowd, he does, he won't learn anything. He just nothing. Either you end up sleeping until somebody took me to a train. I said, ah, this looks like what I'm looking for. <laughs> so restitution simply means that that you have taken away wrongly. You have to do what return it. I remember that it has been an old age principle. In the ancient time, before the intervention of equity, Restitution was so strict that it was meant to be, you know, you say restitution in integral. If, for instance, what you, you know, like mosaic law, you teach for a teeth, a part for a part. If, for instance, you had taken my phone, and maybe this is a Samsung phone, whatever, if you are returning it, you must return the same phone. If you can't even come to say, I will buy you a similar phone, that's not restitution. That's not restitution under the old law. So is either you return it the way it is or you go to jail. And some of the times, before the rule in Clayton Clay's case was denunciated, you're going to remember your equity and trust now. If someone, maybe this is my brother, kept uh, 500 naira here. And somebody steals it. And that has so much a uh, problem, and the person feels, okay, uh, I don't want to go to jail, I'll return your money. And the person now brings pieces, 100 naira into five. That's 500 naira, right? That's no restitution. So you can't take it because it's not restricting. Right. So when equity intervenes, people say, no, this is unjust. This is unjust. That restitution can be made, let it be in integral, either the, the mention or a kind of it, so that it will satisfy what we are trying to do. So that is what this law has done here. And then from here, that you got the principle of what? Free bargain. Restitution. That's where you got the, the principle of free bargain. So, like um, someone who stole billions. And then in the end, he said, okay, I can only bring some few billions, but I own this uh, property. I bought it with part of the proceeds. But so like now, you know that equity regards are done, that which ought to be. And when money is directed to be converted to property, that money becomes what? Property. And if property is directed to be converted to cash, that property becomes what? Cash for the purposes of distribution of the estate of intestate. All right, then the next one is uh, reintegration. It's very similar to that of reconciliation. Reintegration, because you discover that most of the time, you cannot reintegrate, except you have done what reconciled, except you have reconciled. And that's why if most of these reconciliation may even be, it may not even be between the corporate, the convict, and the nominal complaint or the victim. Do you understand? But you look at it holistically, this reconciliation is one with himself. Is it possible for one to be at war with himself? 
Many, very possible. There are people who never forgive themselves. Forgive themselves. Do you understand? So this is what this place is. So you must first of all forgive yourself. You realize what you have done. Is why and also realize that it is me, it's not the end of my life. I can move on. Right. So if you realize the fact that you can move on from that, you are now going into the healing process that does what? Reintegrates you into the society. That's one of the philosophical bases for sentencing. It's also similar to the last point here, restoration. Restoration. You know, restoration is somebody who just has, um, um, so you come to call somebody says, I'm using similar fact evidence against this person. I person will just laugh, say, no, it's not inapplicable to me. Why? Because all things have passed away. Right. Okay. Now, some other thing we need to quickly look at now, forms of punishment. There can be several forms of punishment. It's not foreclosed. Even statutorily, you will see where they enumerate forms of, uh, and then in the end there is what, a discretion. Which tells you there may be a special form of punishment at the discretion of what? Of the judge, depending on what the punishment is all about. Most of the times what we know here is imprisonment, going to jail. Imprisonment is one of them. Option of fine is also one of them. Now, when you talk about fine, fine in the time past was not limited to monetary fine. You are fined 50,000, 90,000 naira. No. Did you know that there was a time somebody could be fined two goods? Yes. Somebody could even be fined maybe a bag of wheat. Somebody could be fined, you know, a portion of his flock. Look at Mosaic law, from even where APT resurrected, you know. And then, um, that sentence, I also want to make, there's something I want to mention here. The, the, that book talk about that sentence. There are exceptions to that sentence. The first one is, a pregnant woman cannot be sentenced to death. But then, how would the court know if a woman is pregnant? Two things come into view here. For those who have the eyes, if the Judas, the judge, is somebody who has the eyes, and, you know some men won't even know their wife are, are pregnant until it's put ready. <laughs> there are people who don't have the eyes. But there are people who have these eyes that will say, I think this woman needs a re-examination. So the court can raise the issue so much, that's the point I'm driving at. The court can raise the issue so much, for which, in which case, the woman will be done was subjected to tests. Pregnancy test to know whether she is pregnant or not. So if she is pregnant, then a lighter punishment will be given to her, maybe convert it to what life imprisonment. Now, the, the defendant or the convict herself can also raise the issue of what pregnancy. When the convict raises the issue of pregnancy, it may be real, it may be phantom. If it's real, it's a velza. It may be phantom. Why? When they want to waste time. When they, you know, the very thought of death, even you, for somebody to flog you now, you be afraid. You're thinking of somebody who is a wealthy, you know, traumatized, looking at her death. Person can do anything to survive. <laughs> he said, my Lord, I'm pregnant. And the court will send her for a test. In the end, the court said, from the test, I have discovered that. The convict is not pregnant. I will go ahead and she appeals. So the pronouncement that the woman is not pregnant is what appealable. That's the another point I want to make. Again. <laughs> it's appealable. I mean, just be enjoying life until that time. It's appealable. Then other kinds of, I will just talk, okay, uh, let me also talk about corporal punishment, corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is divided into two arms. The first arm is that applies in the southern part of Nigeria. And uh, when we talk about that, it, the, what it represents is a caning, caning. A court can make an order for somebody to be caned. Caning is available to everybody. 
irrespective of uh, <laughs> irrespective of who the person is. Tenant is available. Everybody. <laughs> So he does not have regard for religion. He doesn't have regard for religion. For the northern part of Nigeria, an equivalent to Kenny is Hadi Lashi. Hadi Lashi. H A D D I. Hadi. Hadi Lashi. Hadi is an Arabic word which means shameful or shame. It's an Arabic word which stands for shame. And Hadi lashing is prescribed only to Muslim offenders. So even if you are staying in the north and you are not a Muslim, you will not be subjected to what Hadi lashing. And the purpose of Hadi Lashin is not to injure, it's not to injure the person being flogged. But if your skin has seen so much cream, <laughs> so much that, that it must be hot, that one doesn't concern the law, you know. So it is not to injure, but it is to do what? To disgrace. It is to disgrace. So anybody who is sentenced to hardy lashing in the north is taken to be the, a person who has been disgraced. And it applies not to every kind of offenses, but to such offenses as adultery, defamation, Alcohol drinking. I, I ask you to mention it. <laughs> Alcohol drinking and malicious injurious falsehood. And injurious falsehood. So I just thought, uh, let's do this too now. When you talk about alcohol drinking, even the man who will you your drinks, <laughs> the man who will sentence you also drinks. But the thing is that. If you are caught, maybe doing it in such, uh, you know, uh, in a public place, let me say it like that. Maybe you are doing it in public place, and such a way as to corrupt public morality, that's when the person is subjected to this. So alcohol drinking here doesn't mean that the person must be drunk. So that's why most of the time they hide in their rooms to drink it, you know. And then um, there was a time we had this, long journey, I was traveling with a, a Muslim friend, and he had water, this, uh, this rubber, what you call, not kit, not butter. This uh, four liters jerry can, you know, do small jerry can, two liters or so. So, and um, after something, I said, oh boy, you are not even asking me even this. We were traveling from Lagos to, to Medugri by train, because we were reporting for you service. So you're not even asking me if I want to drink. You said, buy water now. <laughs> <laughs> and I would come, and after some time, I began to notice his character started changing, and then the thing started smelling like, I didn't mean, it was beer that he filled into that, I don't think he's drinking water. <laughs> you will just be sipping it. You know, he said without it that the journey is too long because by the time we got on our leg, I'm already swollen. <laughs> so we have also other kinds of punishments such as deportation, deportation, probation order, forfeiture, conditional discharge. Etc. Under some discretionary punishment, under some discretionary punishment, a court can punish and direct 
that the convict embark on community service. The court can direct that the convict embark on community service. You know, for instance, the court can just say, um, every day you are going to do a 200 kilometer quarter clearing or sweep this street every day. And that's why, you know, like uh, in most traffic offenses, you see that kind of punishment like in the US, it's very rampant. Then this lady, she was trying to do time, you know, I think she was juggling between three jobs. And then she was trying to meet with another one. And while she was doing that, she used a wrong, you know, um, they say a wrong, a wrong traffic to name. You know, some of these things we call one way. So she just did it in order to make sure she made up fast with her other patient. But unfortunately, she was caught in the camera, um, went to court, pleaded guilty because there was nothing to hide now. It was obvious, it was clear. You know. So her punishment was to go to that time, that place you should have do, done the U turn and you refuse to do the U-turn. Stay there. You're going to stay there for one week, carrying a play card. Reading, only a fool could have driven the way I drove. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so and you look at it, you think it's funny. It's punishment. Because it's not even easy standing there, both under the rain and sun, you're there holding it. You don't move, you don't get a set, maybe you get the permission of the supervisory officer. Maybe it's ready they say, okay, they give you a respite of some time. You go out after the rain and you come out again, carrying the something for a week or two, depending on what the punishment is all about. 